So, Mario, did the UK cover up of child sex abuse? Uh, yes, it's a simple answer to that. Uh, I think you would be naive or deliberately trying to deceive us if you denied that. So, Mario, did the UK cover up of child sex abuse? Uh, yes, it's a simple answer to that. Uh, I think you would be naive or deliberately trying to deceive us if you denied that. Um, and I'll take you back to the 1970s when one Cyril Smith was worried that the BBC was investigating the private lives of prominent MPs. He wrote to the Director General, Charles Curran, and said he didn't want the private lives of prominent MPs being investigated. He didn't be worried. Charles Curran had already made the decision to block the investigation, and he wrote, I was not prepared to see public resources directed to the pursuit of personal dirt. Now, as we all know, shortly after that, Cyril Smith was exposed by the Rochdale Alternative Paper and Private Eye in 1979, and none of the media covered that. For all those years, that was covered up. The files were passed to MI5. MI5 sat on those files detailing the abuse of Cyril Smith and did nothing. Uh, and we see this again and again. Uh, Lord Janner, who recently died, was being investigated from 1989 by the police. In 1991, his bacon was saved by fellow parliamentarians when MPs of all parties got together in the House of Commons to say it was a witch hunt and Greville Janner, as he then was, should not be pursued. They helped him cheat justice. Who were they if they were not VIPs trying to uh, protect other VIPs from justice? We, of course, have the interview that was done with Tim Fortescue, the chief whip, where he was asked, what is it that you do? How is it that you control MPs? And he said, well, it's simple. When they get into trouble, we sort it out for them, we conceal it, and... Uh, as a result, they are very loyal in future. So he was asked, what sort of trouble do you mean? And he said, scandal involving small boys. It was commonly known how the establishment operated. This is the establishment talking about how it operates to protect VIPs from the process of law. Uh, you had Peter Heyman, who has already been mentioned, the diplomat, whose name was kept out of court proceedings, even though he was a paedophile. Thatcher ordered that his name should not be revealed. Unfortunately for her, the next day, Geoffrey Dickens got round that by naming him in Parliament. But these are the attitudes going right to the top. Um, however, I think there is a danger also here of believing that everything is true or that everything is false. If you have that agenda overriding the evidence... I think that can be very dangerous. <coughs> and I think Ixaro, at times, have been overly influenced by their agenda and have overstepped the mark. I think even more dangerous is believing and trying to propagate the view that all claims are false. And I think that's what Panorama did last year. They spent more money on that Panorama than they have on nearly any program they've ever made. They put more time into it. And the reason, the reason they did that, you might wonder. I mean, that program stepped from criticism of Ixaro onto essentially claiming that all claims of VIP child abuse were false and all claims of a cover-up were false. They stepped way, way beyond that mark. And what was interesting was when they broadcast it. They broadcast a normal panorama on the Monday night the following night, the night David Cameron uh, spoke, the night before David Cameron made his speech at the Tory party conference, and no, I'm not going to go into the details of whether Patrick Rock is guilty or innocent. We should perhaps note that David Cameron's, one of his sidekicks at number 10, is awaiting trial uh, for possession of child sex images. Um, but we're not going to go there. We, say, we are going to say that it was extremely convenient 
for David Cameron that the night before his speech, out went this program rubbishing the idea of VIP child abuse and cover-ups. It took the spotlight away completely from what happened later that day on the Wednesday. And what happened was that Bishop Ball was convicted. He should have been convicted back in the 90s. He, along with a whole raft of Church of England priests and bishops, had been abusing boys on the south coast. In, 90, in the 1990s, he was saved from prosecution by the establishment, by the church, by MPs, by ministers, by royal family. The letters we've seen, each letter, by the way, to the prosecutor says, we are not attempting to intervene, so why were they writing to the prosecutors? The first one is from the former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, not intervening. The next one is from a former Thatcher cabinet minister, Tim Renton, not intervening, just writing, a Lord Justice, MPs, even David Cameron's godfather. They were all writing not to intervene, and as a result of that non-intervention, the prosecutors dropped the charges and took another 20 years for him to come to justice. Uh, the member of the royal family, we don't know who it is, we haven't got a clue. All we have is the non-denial denial from Prince Charles, which says, Clarence House said, the Prince of Wales made no intervention in the judicial process on behalf of Peter Ball. Doesn't say whether he wrote the letter or not. What we do know is he then put Bishop Ball in a house on the Duchy estate. Uh, Ball, by the way, was introduced to him uh, by one Jimmy Savile. Um, so was there a conspiracy? Yes. Many ex-police officers that I've talked to that tried to investigate VIP child abuse, including the now sainted Liam Britton, would say that. Uh, the last was as recently as the Mail on Sunday, this Sunday, yet another officer coming forward to say he was leaned on to not investigate VIP paedophiles. Um, so, and the IPCC are investing many, investigating many more cases like that. Finally, I'd like to echo what Robert said. Mandatory reporting is the only way we're going to change this climate. We came across with another panorama that I made with Sancherberg. Schools that were notified and did nothing. Worse, we found a prominent Catholic school notified of abuse by repeated abuse by one of its teachers who wrote to their lawyers and said, are we all right? Will we get away with it if we don't notify anyone about this abuse? And the lawyers wrote back saying, under the current law, yep, you're in the clear. You don't have to tell anyone about the paedophile on your staff. So I echo totally what Robert said about mandatory reporting. Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> As I mentioned at the start, uh, we did invite someone from uh, Panama to come on the panel, but uh, they wouldn't put anybody up. And I want to put a couple of points uh, to Marion uh, that come from what Kerry Thomas, the editor of Panorama, uh, wrote when he um, wrote a sort of justification of the Panorama that was broadcast last year. And Marion, uh, uh, Kerry Thomas said this, in the atmosphere, we all breathe after the Savile revelations. It's very difficult for institutions to do just enough and not too much. Do you agree that institutions are now doing too much? Well, you certainly couldn't accuse the BBC of doing too much. The only reason that they have announced that they will publish uh, the Dame Janet Smith review, I mean, it sounds like Sounds like a, a bad student show um, up at uh, Edit, the Edinburgh Festival or something with Dame Janet Smith Review, and it has been a bit like that. It's been a farce. Um, she came in on my first interrogation by Nick Pollard in November 2011. We're over four years after that. That was a report that needed to be got out there fast to find out what the failings of the BBC were. They used a pretext to hide behind that the police wouldn't want them to 
uh, put out the review. Um, funnily enough, when police asked them not to put out the panorama, they said, well, they said to the police what they could do themselves and put out the panorama. Um, the, so, I don't think for a second that if they hadn't heard that Ixaro had got a leak of the report and were about to put it out there, that the BBC would have put out the Dame Janet Smith review before Charter and McNeil. They didn't want that material out there. Uh, and I think that's a scandal, frankly. Um, the, it was only when Exaro started going to people and it became clear that they had a leak of the report that anything happened. They were clinging to this idea that they couldn't put the report out because it would prejudice cases. I bet when we go through that finished report, we'd be lucky if we find 1% of it. I can, tell you, I can tell you, Marion, David here has done that job already and he couldn't find it despite <laughs> strenuous efforts. Let me put something else to you that uh, Kerry Thomas wrote uh, in defence of Panorama. He said that politicians staggered into the Savile crisis with their moral authority in tatters over their expenses. And he also says that a group of MPs became fixed on the idea of holding the police feet to the fire. But the line between doing that and interfering in justice is a thin one. Some politicians may have crossed it. Do you agree with Kerry Thomas on that? No, and I think uh, the BBC um, really is in a position where it should be encouraging victims to come forward. Uh, and I think whatever the merits, an attack on the victims or alleged victims at that point uh, was not the most helpful thing for the BBC to be doing, uh, especially if they're talking about interfering in justice and, and so on in, in those comments. And turning to the disclosures that we've had from the Savile Review, from the leak, it talks about a deferential culture, untouchable stars. But this thing about deferential culture, the culture of deference in the BBC, to what extent would you say that's peculiar to the BBC? Is it peculiar to the BBC? No, I think it is. I mean, it's unfortunately common in uh, our industry to the stars and so on. Um, I don't think it is just about BBC, and I think we forget sometimes that the rest of the media, I mean, Paul referred to it, but from 1967 on, various elements of the media knew that Savile was a paedophile and were blocked in various ways for doing it. And at the end of the day, in each case, you can see it, the reason why it happened, but our media should have been braver. And, of course, we shouldn't have had a, a libel law that protected villains and scoundrels like Savile over all those years. Uh, so, no, I don't think that definitely <coughs> culture is just about the BBC. I think the star players in any field, people don't want to worry them, people don't want to offend them. They give them far too much rope. Footballers, premiership, you know, premiership footballers, whatever.